Our next panelist, uh, Allison Desais, is professor of uh, Indian Law, Business Organizations, Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Property, are the courses she teach. Um, she got her A.B. at Georgetown and her J.D. at the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, before joining the New England Law Faculty in 91, she was an associate at Sullivan and Cromwell in New York, uh, where she practiced primarily corporate and securities law. She's author of articles on American Indian law and topics that include religious freedom, property rights, and tribal sovereignty. Please welcome Professor Desais as she presents her paper, Ex Exhibiting Culture in Other Settings, Courts, Agencies, and Indians. Professor. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to say just how happy I am to be here and grateful for the opportunity to be here. I've never been to the Grill Cruise Museum, although I've heard about it for uh, certainly for many, many years. I've never even been to Tulsa, uh, so I'm happy to, to get to see a little bit of the city as well. I have, however, traveled in other parts of Oklahoma because I have some Oklahoma roots. Uh, my mother was born in Oklahoma in the western part of the state and, uh, and grew up, at least in her early years, in, in that part of the state. And her parents were both born and grew up all of their growing up years in, in Oklahoma as well. Uh, so I've certainly come back to Oklahoma about every five years for the last couple decades to attend family reunions, but always out in that part of the state. So I'm happy um, uh, to be in this part of the state um, uh, here today. Um, so yes, yeah, as, as Bill mentioned, my, uh, my presentation is entitled Exhibiting Culture in Other Settings, Courts, Agencies, and Indians. So what I wanted to do is just think about this other type of setting in which cultures might be exhibited. An exhibit is a word that obviously has a meaning in the museum setting, but it certainly has a, a, a meaning in the legal setting as well. Uh, people present exhibits to the, to the court, appended to their legal, legal briefs, for example, in connection with, um, with the case. Um, what I want to focus on then is just uh, what are the kinds of situations in which, or at least two kinds of situations that I'm going to talk about, in which uh, nations, have, Indian nations, have gone uh, to court to present their culture, aspects of their culture, as part of making a particular kind of legal claim? So I'm going to speak about two different situations involving two different First Nations, one in the United States and, and one in Canada, in which these nations have gone to court or gone to an administrative agency and presented aspects of their culture as part of making their, their claims. Uh, the first case involves a First Nation from, from Canada that uh, exhibited aspects of its culture in connection with making a claim uh, for recognition of Aboriginal title to its territory. Uh, the second one involves a tribe in the state of uh, Virginia that, uh, so, that exhibited various aspects of its culture as part of efforts to fight a, um, a reservoir project which would destroy uh, an area which has cultural and religious significance uh, for that tribe. And what I'm trying to do here is just look at some of the issues that the, these two nations have confronted as they've presented aspects of their culture in these two settings, and then also offer some thoughts on whether it's paid off, you know, whether, what, what, was it worth exposing information that you usually would keep private in these public settings as part of bringing legal claims. And then finally, I also, also want to draw some parallels between exhibiting culture in the museum setting and in these settings, but I hope you'll uh, think about that question as well, because no doubt you can, you can come up with some other thoughts on that question uh, yourselves. Uh, so the, the nations I'm going to focus on are the Gitson Nation of, of Western Canada and the Mattapani Tribe of Virginia. Uh, why these two? Well, first of all, I just think they're, they're uh, two nations that have experiences uh, that, uh, that give us the opportunity to learn about some of the challenges they've confronted as they've exhibited culture before courts and government agencies. In addition, though, I chose them because they both have, um, are, they both are, interest, are represented in, I think, very interesting ways at the Muse National Museum of the American Indian in Washington. Um, now, the, as far as the Gitson Nation is concerned, there are a number of, of objects related to them that are included in the, um, the museum's collection, but what I want to mention is something other than an object or something that goes beyond an object, which is a video uh, that is available on the website of the National Museum of the American Indian. If you just type in um, uh, Gitsan, uh, uh, G-I-T-X-S-A-N, you, you'll come up with this. And in this video, um, a woman named Shirley Mulden, acting as a representative of the Gitsan, uh, holds in her hands an object. Um, she describes it as a shaman spirit canoe in the, in the form of a land otter. And she talks about the objects and talks about the way in which a shaman would make use of it uh, in, uh, in, his, uh, in his work. Uh, this video was filmed as, as part of an exhibition called Listening to Our Ancestors, The Art of Native Life Along the North Pacific Coast. 
So that's the Gitsa Nation, how they're represented in the museum. As, as the Mattapanai tribe, uh, there's a wonderful uh, interactive exhibit uh, related to that tribe in the National Museum of the American Indian. And what it involves is you taking a sort of virtual boat ride up the waterways and through the waterways of um, the Mattapanai uh, homeland. And as you do this, you're guided by um, a narration from a tribal member. So essentially, you have a, a large video screen, a screen in front of you and controls that you can use to steer your boat and choose what direction you want to go in uh, as you, um, as you, you know, work your way through, um, through this learning process. So if you're ever at the National Museum, definitely look, look that up. You might have to uh, spend some time elbowing aside a couple kids who really like it, which I had to do repeatedly to get to enjoy it uh, myself as much as I wanted to. Now, as, as far as this museum is, con is concerned, I don't believe, at least from searching the museum's website, I don't believe that there's anything related to either of these uh, nations, the Gitsa Nation or the, or the Mattapanai tribe here in the collection of the museum. Uh, they that being said, I was interested in uh, walking around the, the museum's um, exterior uh, to see the colonial garden. It's one of the lovely gardens that's set out on the grounds. And the plaque at the entrance to the colonial garden, I was interested to see something that was in that plaque uh, because it refers to colonists claiming the Virginia wilderness. And I was really struck by that uh, and what it made me think about is, well, I don't know what area of Virginia they were talking about uh, in that plaque. But at least if they're talking about the area of Virginia that the Mattapanai tribe is from, they would beg to differ that that was a wilderness uh, when, um, when uh, colonists first came to, the, came to that area. Because uh, indeed, we, we know that there was some you know, settled agriculture in that part of Virginia and had been for a considerable amount of time by the time that colonists um, first, first arrived there. So putting that aside, though, just getting on to some, some more of the legal issues I want to talk about. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is just what, what was it that brought these um, two nations to, the, to being at the point where they felt they needed to exhibit aspects of their culture before judges, bureaucrats, and other kinds of outsiders? So what were they trying to accomplish? What were their goals in, in doing this? Uh, first thing I noticed is that it, just in a very general sense, what they were trying to do, the goal that they had in mind, was basically the same goal that um, people have in the museum setting when they're exhibiting aspects of, of culture. Basically, they're seeking to educate and inform others. Uh, but in the legal setting, of course, it also needs to go beyond that. Uh, in particular, they have specific goals in mind that are, are shaped not by their own interests and their own sense of what's significant about their culture, but rather by the fact that they're making specific legal claims. They have to shape the um, aspects of culture they're presenting to, to fit with those legal claims. And uh, along with the, the claims is the idea that there are particular legal rules uh, that set out what you're supposed to, to say and what kind of evidence you're supposed to present if you want to make certain kinds of legal claims. Uh, so that they also ne needed to have in mind as they were thinking about what to exhibit about our culture, how to exhibit it, uh, so forth. So, so to get a, into a little bit more of the specifics, uh, as far as the, the Gitskin are concerned, I mentioned they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're from Canada, they're a First Nation, uh, to use the, the terminology that's used in Canada to, uh, to refer to what we would call tribes. Uh, as they describe themselves, they derive their strength from 33,000 square kilometers of traditional territory in Northwest British Columbia. The English translation of their name is the people of the River of Mist, a name that reflects their, their connection to their river, uh, the Skeena River. In the early 80s, uh, 39 of the hereditary chiefs of the Gitskin uh, went to the Canadian court system and brought suit in a case called uh, Dalgamook v. British Columbia. And they were seeking recognition of their Aboriginal title to their territory, as well as recognition of their jurisdiction, uh, their sovereignty over that territory. Uh, they chose this course of action after everything else had failed. They had been in negotiation with the provincial government for years, and nothing came of it. Now, under the Canadian legal test for establishing Aboriginal title, uh, there are three things that you have to show. Uh, one of them is you have to show that the land that you claim, claim title to was occupied prior to the assertion of sovereignty by the British Crown. Um, secondly, if you're relying on present occupation uh, as proof of pre-sovereignty occupation, then you've got to show uh, th that uh, you have to, let's see, what do you have to do here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, getting ahead of myself here. You have to show the continuity, uh, sort of logically, uh, at least in a legal sense, logically, continuity between your pre-sovereignty occupation and your occupation today. And then lastly, uh, you have to show that at the time that sovereignty was asserted, your occupation was exclusive. So in this case, uh, the plaintiffs were discussing aspects of their culture, including their law related to land tenure, as part of this effort to show their use and occupancy of their land. 
Uh, what about my other, um, uh, other, uh, the other nation I'm speaking about here? Uh, what were the Mattapanai trying to, trying to accomplish? You know, why were they brought to the point of putting their culture on display in a sense? Uh, and I mentioned they're a, a tribe from, from Virginia. Uh, their ancestors were members of the, the Powhatan Confederacy, the, uh, the, the Confederacy of Virginia Algonquian tribes that were there uh, and met uh, Captain John Smith and other English settlers uh, who came to that area in the 17th century. Uh, they were one of the tribes that signed a treaty in 1677, the Treaty of Middle Plantation, with the British Crown. Uh, this treaty, well, among other things, established a three-mile buffer zone between the tribe's lands and colonists' lands, recognized tribal fishing and gathering rights, and also established a tribal commitment to offer what was described as a rent, an annual rent, to the governor of Virginia. And that's something that the tribe has continued to do for you know, decades now, more than decades, centuries now, and continues to do to this day. Uh, now, interestingly, the, uh, the treaty calls for 20 beaver skins to be presented, but beavers being rather scarce these days in that part of Virginia, uh, at least in recent years, it's, it's tended to be a deer or a or turkey. But the important thing is that they, they continue to honor their side of the treaty. Uh, this tribe has a 150-acre reservation in Virginia, recognized by the state, uh, the dates of the 17th century. At this point, though, they don't have official recognition as a tribe or official recognition of their reservation uh, by the federal government. Now, uh, in terms of their legal claims and what, they're, what brought them to present their culture, since the 80s, they've been involved in trying to fight uh, a project to build a, a reservoir. Uh, and the reservoir is designed to, to, to uh, designed to create a, a, a longer term and larger supply of water, not for the, the county they reside in, not for cities or towns near them, certainly not for their reservation, uh, but rather for the city of Newport News and other coastal Virginia cities, which say, we need more water and here's where we plan to get it. Uh, as part of this project, well, here's what's involved in it. It would involve building a 1,500-acre reservoir. Uh, where would that come from? Well, you'd, you'd, they'd dam a creek. This would flood over 400 acres of wetlands and would eliminate 21 miles of streams. Uh, then water would be pumped out of the Mattapanai River, sometimes up to 75 million gallons a day, into, this, into the reservoir via an intake structure that have to be built into the river. And then they'd have to build pipelines to get the water from that intake structure to the new reservoir, and then additional pipelines to go another 12 miles or so uh, to get the water closer to Newport News and the other cities that want it. Now, in order for this project to go forward, a federal permit is needed. They need to get a federal permit from the Army Corps of Engineers under the Clean Water Act because of the damage that it's known this will do to wetlands. Uh, if the project does eventually go forward, it will represent the largest single permitted wetland loss in the Mid-Atlantic region ever you know, since the Clean Water Act Act uh, was, um, was put into place. Now, the reservation of the tribe that I mentioned that they've had since the 17th century is on the Mattapanai River, and it's about three miles downstream from the proposed intake structure for the project. So the tribe has been objecting now for, um, for some time to this project because of the adverse impact that, that they know it will have on them environmentally, culturally, and economically. So the tribe then has provided evidence of its culture in efforts to persuade the Army Corps of Engineers not to grant the permit uh, for this project. Now, a couple other details about how, um, you know, how, how, do tribes, how do these nations move forward in terms of bringing their um, uh, aspects of the culture to these, these non-Indian decision makers. Uh, first of all, just one thing to think about is, well, who takes on their responsibility? Uh, who, in a, in a, we might use a museum term, who is acting as curator of aspects of the culture and deciding you know, what to present to the court or the, or the Army Corps of Engineers and how to do it? Uh, well, for the Gitson Nation, the, you know, the, the first and foremost, the people that are, that are acting as curators and presenting aspects of the culture are the 39 hereditary chiefs who are the, um, the plaintiffs. Uh, they're the plaintiffs in this litigation on behalf of their, their houses. Uh, they've been assisted, though, by other members of, the nation, of their nation, including um, other chiefs, as well as attorneys, of course. There's court involved, so you've got to have some attorneys in there as well, uh, and also anthropologists. And anthropologists have, have, do, did, have done a huge amount of work in gathering statements from members of the nation and preparing these statements for presentation in written form uh, to the court. Uh, and this trial has, uh, and the efforts to prepare for the trial and to present um, uh, gets in culture in the trial have resulted in a huge amount of, of paper being produced. Uh, the transcript evidence from the trial amounts to 23,500 pages in terms of exhibits that were filed with the court. There are about 9,200 exhibits filed, comprising well over 50,000 pages. So a huge amount of information brought to the, to the court, uh, initially brought to the Supreme Court of British Columbia to, you know, to document the aspects of, um, of the 
culture of the Gitsa Nation that support their claim to Aboriginal title in this area. Uh, in addition to these written submissions, several of the chiefs went to court in person to bear witness uh, to their culture and to present um, you know, their, their evidence based on their culture of uh, what was at stake here and how uh, they could establish that this was indeed their territory. Uh, at times, they were assisted by interpreters who tried to render into English concepts, uh, uh, Gitson concepts. You know, who knows how, uh, how well they were able to accomplish that, because we all know making those kinds of translations of concepts that are significant in one culture into another one does not always go as, as perfectly as, as we might like. Uh, in addition, they had people called word spellers present, whose, uh, whose job was to take Gitson words and try to transform them into, um, into English spellings. Uh, as far as the, the Mattapanai tribe was concerned, who, is, who acted as, as their curators, uh, well, in their case as well, they had their chief, other tribal leaders, uh, other members of the tribe, attorneys to help, um, to help them put their evidence together. Now, given that they were presenting evidence to uh, a federal uh, administrative body, the, you might call it the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, they weren't coming to court and testifying in that sense. Rather, most of it was presented in, um, in written form uh, to the, um, the Army Corps of en Engineers district that was initially making the decision about um, whether or not to grant the permit. In addition, the tribe welcomed the Army Corps of Engineers um, Norfolk District Commander, a man named uh, Colonel Alan Carroll, and members of his staff to, the, to their reservation. So uh, Colonel Carroll and, and staff members got to spend time on the reservation with tribal members, learn about what this project would involve and how would it, would it affect them. So that's who acted as curators. Well, what, what, was, what did they have to tell? You know, what, uh, what aspects of their culture did they feel they needed to share with the court or with the Army Corps of Engineers? Uh, for the Gitson Nation, again, they're, they were cl they're claiming ownership of, um, of their, um, their traditional territory. And to do that, they shared many aspects of their culture with the court. They presented evidence related to land ownership, resource management in their economy, social and governance structure and s structures and systems, history and spirituality. At the heart of the proof that they offered is um, something that's called the Adauk, uh, and I'm sure I'm not quite saying that correctly, but that's, uh, that's at least the pronunciation I found given online. Uh, it's spelled A-D-A-A-W-K, the Adauk of each of the houses. Uh, the houses are the basic political units of the Gitson nation, and each individual uh, Gitson is, a, is born into the house of, of his or her mother. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, in which ultimately got to look at into this, um, this claim, uh, provided this definition of, of a Dao. The court defined it as a house's, house's collection of sacred oral traditions about their ancestors, histories, and territories. The content of an adauk includes also its physical representations, such as totem poles, and it also identifies and provides the foundation for the crests that are displayed on totem poles. Uh, the crests and the poles then link each house um, to its land, as the following quote uh, explains. While the crest displayed on its pole encode the history of each house, they also recreate the link between the spirit forces that give the people their power. Reaching upward, yet firmly planted in the ground, the pole links humans, spirit, and land. Now, I mentioned, as, a, as, the, as described by the um, Supreme Court of Canada, these are oral traditions, sacred oral traditions. So how have they been preserved so they can continue to, to function as important institutions for the, the Gitsa Nation? Uh, well, the way in which this has taken place is that they are repeated, performed, and authenticated at important feasts hosted by the chiefs of the various houses for various kinds of important events, uh, these, these feasts being held in the feast halls of each of the houses. Uh, as the uh, adauks are recited, the guest chiefs and others who are there as witnesses to the recital uh, are given the opportunity to object if they question any details of the recital of the particular houses of adauk. They can object, and th this serves to authenticate as well as preserve the content of the adauk. Now, the description I've just given you, that's something I've drawn from uh, Canadian uh, uh, court opinions as well as what anthropologists have said about them, uh, but I think more helpful is just to hear uh, a description of the importance of the Adauk and, and why it's important to tell the Adauk from one of the chiefs who testified in litigation, uh, Chief Gyoglu Yat, also known as Mary McKenzie. So she was asked, why is it important to tell the Adauk? So this is what she said. Because the Adauk tells in a feast house who are the holders of fishing places, creeks, and mountains that belong to each house of the chiefs, where they get food like berries. They tell the owner in the location. How I have my knowledge now is by attending the feasting of any chief. Even if it's my own feasting, I hear the chiefs repeat the adauk of theirs and ours. This is the importance of the feasting that these adauks are told. 
Uh, she was asked about the truthfulness of the adauk of her house, and that's something that, that the court, um, uh, at least the initial court, the trial court, had a lot of concern about. How can we tell this is oral tradition? How can we tell that this is true when you tell us that this shows that these are your, your lands? So she was asked about truthfulness of the adauk of her house, and she sort of treated it as, as a question that's just absurd. She said, in Gitzkan law, all adauks are true. How could the adauk be repeated if it's not true to the Gitzkan people? They got to be accurate, and I know from experience that they are accurate. So again, in, this, um, in the litigation, this case, the Delgamo case, she and these other witnesses shared portions of their, the adults of their various houses as proof of the existence of a system of land tenure law that was internal to the nation and which covered the whole territory that they were claiming. So this helped to support their argument, their, their claim to use and occupation of all the territory that was covered by their, their um, uh, claim for recognition of Aboriginal title. Now, what about the, the Mattapani tribe? What uh, aspects of their culture did they put on display uh, initially to, um, uh, to the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, but this also becomes public once the Army Corps of Engineers you know, publishes its record of decision? Well, they noted a couple of things about their culture that they thought needed to be uh, presented to the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, first, locations of earlier tribal settlements, which include about 100, uh, I'm sorry, include about 80 uh, sites that might be eligible for inclusion on in the National Register of Historic Places. Now, to outsiders, you know, these sites of early uh, tribal settlement, early tribal activity, what are those? Those are archaeological sites. What do you do with them? Uh, if, you're, if you're concerned about them being flooded out, you go document them, you excavate them, you photograph them. If, there's, if there, there are things that you feel should be preserved, you take them out of there and you're done with it. Uh, the tribe explained, though, that that's not going to work, uh, that these tribes have, uh, that these sites rather have greater significance that would not be respected by that, that approach. Uh, so this is, these are the words of, of Chief Costello. The places have tremendous emotional and symbolic significance for the tribe. Not only have they been important to us for centuries, but also because they re re represent some of the last remaining physical links we have with our ancestors. Other sites have already been wiped out by development from hundreds of years of encroachment. If the King William Reservoir is built, we will lose an historic and cultural heritage that these sites represent. Uh, secondly, the second thing that, that the tribe offered um, uh, connected to his culture is the importance of fishing uh, for, for shad, the, the uh, fish species shad in particular, to the livelihood and the identity of tribal members. Now, shad, I don't know that shad exist in, in uh, uh, no, I don't think that shad uh, could exist in, um, in Oklahoma because shad are one of those anadromous fish that, that spawn in the, uh, they live in the ocean, but they swim upstream to spawn and then go back to the ocean. Uh, and they live in various rivers of the, the Mattapani um, uh, homeland. Now, to many outsiders, you know, fishing, you know, big deal. It's a recreational activity. It's a, le le it's a leisure activity. For some people, it might be a commercial activity. But it doesn't have the same resonance and importance that it does uh, for, the, for the Mattapani tribe, as they try to explain. Uh, for them, fishing for shad on the river has been something they've done for, f since time immemorial. And it has a you know, central value within their culture. Chief Costello explained that the river is more than a source of food and money for the tribe. The river and the shad are the basis of our culture and traditions. Now, the, the shad stocks in Virginia's rivers have been subjected to you know, over, overfishing and uh, habitat degradation for a very long time, and so the, 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 the stocks of shad are severely depleted to the extent that shad fishing is banned in Virginia's rivers, except for members of, of Virginia tribes. Uh, they have an exemption uh, from this, um, this ban on shad fishing, and they've They've played a, a tremendous role in trying to revive the shad species in the waters of their part of Virginia through a tribal fish hatchery. And uh, the importance of fishing to the tribe is, of course, reflected in that old treaty from 1677 where they were guaranteed rights to fish in, um, in the rivers of this area. Uh, thirdly, the tribe presented evidence of the continued importance of uh, hunting and gathering activities in the area. Uh, tribal members still gather about 60 wild plant species for food, medicinal and ceremonial purposes, uh, both on their reservation and the surrounding area. And indeed, one of the plants that they still gather is, is Tuckahoe, a plant that is specifically mentioned in that 1677 treaty. So there, there's an explicit grant of a recognition of their continuing right to, to um, uh, gather Tuckahoe. Now, to outsiders, you know, hunting, gathering, again, you know, leisure activities, what's the big deal here? Just go do that stuff somewhere else if this area is, is flooded out. Uh, to the tribe, though, this has been part of what they've done for thousands of years. Uh, they voice fears that, um, that the adverse impact of um, the project on these activities would alter their way of life and ultimately could end their, exist their very existence as a tribe. 
And finally, the tribe presented evidence of their traditional religious practices and ways of life and the adverse effects of the project would, would have that on them. At the heart of their concern is the river itself, the Mattapani River, river itself. The river unites tribal members to religious ceremonies, and the tribe explained that alterations to the natural state of the river would compromise the sanctity of these religious ceremonies. Uh, just a, another quote from Chief Costello, he said, all my life I fished out there, from a little boy on up, you had to eat the fish, you had to get out here and dig in the earth to get what you needed to live. We wouldn't be here today without that river. Now, you know, to many outsiders, you know, river's a river, uh, and, you know, if you sort of you know, plug yourself into this sort of drill baby drill uh, culture, then, you know, this is just another resource to be exploited. What's the big deal? Uh, but obviously, uh, it is a big deal, a very big deal to, to this tribe. Uh, in addition, very reluctantly, the tribe shared information about the location of a sacred site uh, that is located in the valley of the creek, that is the creek that's supposed to be dammed uh, to form this reservoir. Uh, the tribe explained the destruction of the site would undercut the cultural identity of the tribe itself. Now, once the tribe mentioned the existence of a sacred site, and it came rather late in the game because of their reluctance to, to reveal uh, the location of this site, what did that lead to, as you might expect, uh, accusations that um, this, is, this doesn't really exist. Uh, uh, th these are accus accusations, of course, from supporters of the project, uh, questioning the connection of this site, even if it does exist to the tribe. And then finally saying, well, even if it does exist, even if it's significant to you, you can relocate it. Let's relocate this site to a different location uh, so it won't be, prevent, pre be destroyed by the project. But of course, it doesn't work that way. Uh, relocation's not a possibility. There's no way you can take the spiritual integrity of one site and simply move it to another location. Finally, was it worth it? Uh, you know, were the, when these various nations presented, when these two nations presented these aspects of their culture to a court, to an, to an agency, to try to vindicate their legal rights, you know, did it work? Uh, well, as far as the Gitson Nation is concerned, the, the, the initial answer is definitely no. Uh, the British Columbia Supreme Court decided to give no independent weight after receiving all these thousands of pages of, of evidence about um, uh, that a lot of it tied to their adult, that talked about you know, what territories were theirs, et cetera. The, the court decided it would give no independent weight to this evidence, uh, the evidence of use and occupancy that was contained in the adults and other kinds of oral um, uh, history that were presented to the court. The court said that the, this could not serve as evidence of detailed history or land ownership, use, or occupation, and therefore the court rejected the Aboriginal title claim. Uh, the court expressed some sympathy for the nation, but went on to, to give this comment. The plaintiffs must understand that our courts are courts of law, which labor under disciplines that do not always permit judges to do what they might subjectively think or feel might be the right or just thing to do in a particular case. I'm sure that the plaintiffs understand that although the Aboriginal laws which they recognize could be relevant on some issues, I must decide this case only according to what they call the white man's law. Uh, reacting to the decision, one of the Gitson chiefs remarked, um, <sighs> I always get, sorry, I get choked up when I think about this quote, but here it is. This is the last time that the sacred boxes of our people will be opened for the white man to see. Um, so, okay, but happily, that's not the end of the story. Um, the case was ultimately, ultimately made, made its, way, uh, its way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the court held that the trial judge had erred in, treat, in the treatment of the Gitson Adauks and other oral history evidence. Uh, in particular, the, the um, Supreme Court of Canada said that the Supreme Court of British Columbia had uh, erred in discounting the Adauks as being not literally true. So again, the, the truthfulness had been questioned, and the Supreme Court of Canada said that's now how you're supposed to, to be thinking about this, this evidence. Also, uh, the trial judge was faulted for questioning the utility of the Adauk to demonstrate use and occupation on the grounds that they were not sufficiently detailed about specific lands. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada said there might well be sufficient detail in here uh, to allow these claims to, um, to go forward. Uh, so in short, the approach did not give the adults the weight that they should have been given uh, by the, by the, um, uh, through the actions of the, of the trial judge. Had they been assessed correctly, the Supreme Court of Canada said the factual findings might have been very different. Uh, therefore, those factual findings could not stand and a new trial was warranted. Uh, and the court said at a new trial, the evidence could be considered in light of what the court said should be the proper treatment of the adults and other oral history evidence. The court also reiterated a statement that it made in another case. Uh, this is what it said, the courts must, quote, interpret the evidence of Aboriginal peoples in light of the difficulties inherent in adjudicating Aboriginal claims. And among these difficulties is the fact that the evidence that, that Native peoples often will be presenting to support these claims is simply not the kind of evidence that, uh, whether it's Canadian courts or American courts for that, uh, for that matter, are used to, to hearing. 
The court also said in conclusion of its opinion, though, that, um, that its preference was for negotiation of a settlement instead of continued litigation. And that's indeed the path that the parties have taken, and they're involved in ongoing negotiations for the settlement of the, the land claims of the, the Gitson Nation. So we'll see what happens, the ultimate outcome of their efforts to, um, to you know, use their, their culture as evidence of a use of occupation. The ultimate outcome is at this point uncertain, uh, but certainly more hopeful than it was uh, at the time that the British Columbia Supreme Court first, um, uh, first issued its opinion. On to the, the Mattapanai, though. So how would things work out with them? Well, at least initially, they're exhibiting their culture seemed to have been much more successful, certainly much more successful than the Gitson Nation's experience was. Uh, Colonel Carroll, the Norfolk District Commander, recommended against the granting of the permit for the project. He explained that the risk to the continued way of life of the tribe, along with the risk to the environment and entire watershed shed were just too great. Uh, and in his record of decision revealed the way in which he took the, these culturally based concerns of the tribe very seriously in his decision making. Uh, so I'm going to try to skim over this quickly, but for the archeolo archeological sites, he, he noted their concern and noted the data recovery, even though that might be appropriate in other circumstances, uh, was not necessarily the appropriate approach in this context. And if the project did ultimately proceed, the tribe would need to be consulted further on these issues. As to fishing, he noted the importance of fishing to the shad fishing to the tribe, and he determined that monitoring and an amelioration plan would be needed if the permit were ultimately issued uh, for, the, for the project. And finally, as to the threat to the traditional religious practices and way of life, he said that while the religious aspects of the river may not be fully appreciated by non-native people, this lack of appreciation by non-Indians does not depreciate or invalidate this value. He also now acknowledged specifically their concerns about really revealing location of the, of the sacred site. He noted that the tribe agreed to reveal the site's existence only, quote, when faced with the untenable choice of either disclosing the site's identity and risk its desecration by pot hunters, or failing to mention it and risk its loss. He honored the tribe's request for confidentiality and did not include a detailed description of the site in his record of decision. So he didn't disclose its location or any details about it or its, um, its particular significance. However, he didn't have the last word. Um, Colonel Carroll's decision was essentially appealed by the governor of the state of Virginia to his, his, uh, his boss, uh, essentially the, nor the, um, the person in charge of the North Atlantic Division of the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, who decided to go ahead and grant the permit. And so it looked for a while as if the project would, um, would move forward. In reaction to that, to that action, though, the tribe and a number of the environmental groups that it's been working with over, um, you know, over a couple decades now filed suit in U.S. federal court to, to appeal this, um, the granting of, the, of the, um, the permit. And on March 31st of just this year, I was very you know, happy to learn uh, that the federal district court for the District of Columbia held that the court acted improperly when it decided to issue this permit. It's there, the, the opinion's much more uh, explicit, of course, in that, but they, they go through a number of ways in which the uh, North Atlantic Division um, commander acted in, inappropriately, acted arbitrarily and capriciously to use the administrative law terminology in issuing the permit. The opinion went on to also um, chide the Environmental Protection Agency and to say that it acted improperly in deciding not to veto issuance of the permit. Uh, the EPA has, uh, has authority uh, to, issue, to veto issuance of an, a permit by the, um, uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Engineers if it wants to. So it's got that power but chose not to exercise it in this case. And that was a little strange in that the EPA had, had uh, actually expressed support for Colonel Carroll's decision to deny the permit. But once the higher ups decided to grant it, EPA declined to get involved. Uh, so is this over? Well, again, we still don't know for sure. In an April 30th press release, uh, the Newport News city manager announced that Newport News is suspending all work on the project. He stated that, quote, there are not a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the project. Uh, that being said, the defendants in the litigation still have until the end of this month to appeal that um, federal court decision. Uh, so I guess I, I'm sort of cautiously optimistic that, that, that the tribe's uh, efforts to present its you know, culture uh, as evidence of what's at stake and what will be destroyed and what should be protected. I, I'm cautiously optimistic that, that, that those efforts are going to pay off and that, they're, and that um, in other words, they're, they'll have been successful in defending both their cultural heritage and their living culture against the plans um, of this project. Uh, I'm going to conclude, believe it or not, I'm, I'm almost at the, at the end here. I want to conclude with them um, with two quotes. Uh, uh, first of them drawn from that 1677 treaty at Middle Plantation that I mentioned. The treaty sets out that it was drawn up for the firm grounding of a good and just peace 
and that it may be a secure and lasting one founded upon the strong pillars of reciprocal justice by confirming to the Indians their just rights. The second one is, is a final statement, it's a, essentially the last line in the uh, Canadian Supreme Court Chief Justice's opinion in the Dal Dalgamuk v. British Columbia case. And this is a statement he made, at, makes after urging that um, settlement be considered as an alternative to continued litigation. And what he says is, let us face it, we are all here to stay. So trying to draw those two together, I just say, if we are indeed all here to stay, and maybe this is a big assumption here, but I'm going to, at least for the moment, assume that U.S. and Canadian legal systems really do want a good and just peace, then I feel that courts and agencies need to be more willing, more open to hearing and also heeding, you know, actually paying attention to the culture-related evidence and culture-related claims presented by First Nations. Only in this way will the law truly and at last confirm the nations, these nations' just rights. Thank you for your, your patience if I went on a bit too long there. Thank you.